and I am happy to be here on Wednesday, March 15th, right in the middle of March for today's live cast. I'll be here for the next hour to share some Stonemaier Games news. No big news, just little things that we're working on um, to answer your questions and to discuss some random topics, just random things going on, most of them game related, some of them cat related. In fact, just yesterday I filmed a cat related video or a pet related video for April Fools. I'm looking forward to posting that on April 1st in a few weeks. I also filmed a video yesterday about um, about expeditions, did another expeditions video. That will be ready, that will launch, I think I'm doing every other week. So I think that'll be next Thursday that I'll share that video. That video is about replayability and variability in our upcoming game, Expeditions. As for a product that we've already released or that we're in the process of releasing, the Tapestry um, Fantasies and Futures expansion, if you pre-ordered it on launch week, sorry, I have a eyelash in my eye, I think, um, then I, I have confirmation that uh, most of the fulfillment centers have shipped all orders that were made during launch week. And uh, the U.S. Fulfillment Center will be done by the end of today. That is the latest update that I have right now. And so that means that most likely you should have received a tracking confirmation. There are some circumstances where maybe you wouldn't receive that, like if maybe you entered your email incorrectly or if the Fulfillment Center messed up somehow and didn't send the, email, the tracking confirmation. But um, we're, we are just uh, two weeks out uh, what is that, 10 business days out from the original launch of Tapestry Fantasies and Futures and the custom, uh, the custom insert that goes along with it. I will mention for the custom insert, if you're working on assembling it, um, I would recommend going to our website, go to, go to the webpage on our website for the custom insert for Tapestry and uh, look at, use the instructions that are downloadable from that page. And there's even a video there from Nacho Average Tabletop, something that, that uh, he created on his own, independently of us, that was very nice of him to do. Um, but uh, check out that video, check out those versions of the instructions, because apparently for version two in particular, the version that holds the base snaps, um, which I know a lot of people don't have, but if you do have them, that version, there's a mistake in the instructions or a little thing that isn't as clear as it should be. So check out the instructions that are on our website. I can say that even with the original instructions, as someone who is new to Folded Space, I was able to put together the insert. It took a little extra time, took some trial and error, but I, I did figure it out for version one. So uh, even if you're very new to assembling an insert from Folded Space, it is possible with the original instructions, even if you don't end up hearing what I'm saying right now or don't want to bother with downloading it or watching that other video. Yeah. Uh, Carlos says that he had his first play actually of Tapestry Fantasies and Futures just last night. He says he, he loved it. I especially like the new sieves as they seem to be more involved. I know that you're working on adjusting the previous sieves, but how are you, but I'm curious how you are approaching the process. Um, yeah, I'll answer that first. Carlos has another question, but um, the the process has been very long. Like it's been something that, that we, I think I opened maybe around this time last year, maybe even before, but there's a very, very long thread on Board Game Geek where we've kind of just openly discussed it. Um, there are some people who know Tapestry really, really well, and so they've had some, some strong, well-informed opinions there. We've also been collecting data with some of the smaller adjustments on Board Game Arena, but that's only for the core game. So uh, in the meantime, we've been collecting data from anyone who submits it to us on our website for the, uh, for the first two expansions as well. So part of it is data-driven. Part of it is also anecdotal because with the final adjustments, we're not just going for balance. Balance is very important, maybe the most important thing here, but we're also going for fun. And so there are a few sieves that were perceived as a lot less fun than the other ones. And so we are revisiting those and uh, re heavily revising a few of them. I, I even redesigned a few of them. So um, yeah, that, that's what the process has looked like so, so far. Carlos also says, when you are ready to reprint, when you're ready to print the final version of them, would you include a complexity rating as Dune Imperium does with its character mats? I do appreciate that Dune Imperium does that. I have to say it's really, really hard for me to do that. I think it's a reasonable request, but it's so subjective. Um, what we have done, Carlos, is that if you look in the rule book, and I'll try to find it here. If you look in the rule book for Tapestry, Fantasies and Futures, I am pretty sure in this rule book, we put some recommendations, or maybe we didn't put it here. I'm trying to remember. I, I know we created a list. I, I kind of uh, crowdsourced a list of civilizations to see what people thought in terms of tier rankings. And maybe I plan to put that in the, where did I? I'm looking through the rule book right now. I thought we put it in this rule book, but maybe we didn't. Maybe, I'm, maybe I saved that for, uh, for the future. Yeah, maybe I did save it. Yeah, somewhere I have a list. I do have a tier list. 
I don't think it will be noted on the civilizations themselves, although it could be. Um, but yeah, I'll make a note to myself to find that the tier list, because I'm pretty sure I put that together at one point. I don't remember where it ended up. Uh, I must have been saving it for um, the final SID pack. Yeah, good question there. Ah, Jonathan reminded me that today is Ted Lasso Day, season three. The final season of Ted Lasso begins today. Oh, we'll have a tough choice then. We were going to either watch, we were planning to watch Mandalorian today at lunch, but uh, maybe we should go with Ted Lasso. Megan and I will have to talk about that. Yeah, we'll figure it out at lunchtime. Steven says that he is enjoying Tapestry Fantasies and Futures as well. Josh says he just got back from Dice Tower this past weekend. Josh, did you see my coworker Alex there? Alex was at the Dice Tower West convention this past weekend. Josh says he had a lot of fun meeting with people and publishers, and he had a fantastic job. I'm really glad to hear, or fantastic time. I'm really happy to hear that, Josh. Um, Corey from Blue Falcon Board Gaming says that only there, there are two days before the Meeples at Sea Board Game Cruise. There are a few board game cruises happening, happening this winter, aren't there? This is one. I think the Joko Cruise happened recently. Um, I'm pretty sure there's a Dice Tower Cruise at some point. That's awesome. I hope you have fun at that, Corey, if you're, if you're attending it. Um, what else is going on today? I guess before I forget, I'll do my chocolate of the day. So today's chocolate of the day is Wispa, bit of Wispa specifically. This is chocolate that a friend in England sent to us and that we really enjoyed. And so I found a place where we could actually buy it in these little packs. And it's this really kind of nice aerated chocolate in the middle, really delicious chocolate. So this will be not this entire pack, but part of the pack that I've already opened will be my chocolate of the day today. What is your treat of the day? How are you indulging or treating yourself in moderation, of course, as always, but a little treat to yourself uh, usually can't hurt. Let me know what you are doing today to, uh, to treat yourself. Um, what else is going on? I'll, I'll do a few more questions then I'll look at uh, some of the topics that I have. I have some, a few visuals to show off today. Uh, Nate says, I recall you once saying that you wouldn't design a sports game, but, uh, but perhaps a racing game one day. Have you ever played the 1960s 3M sports series game Win, Place, and Show? I don't think I have played that. It's a horse racing and betting game that is quite, int quite fun. Very interesting mechanisms that I don't believe have been replicated in other derby games. The, he says the, the board design is, is kind of ugly. If you're interested, I can always email you or lend you my copy too. Thank you, Nate, for mentioning that. Yeah, I'll have to I'll have to see if Geekway has that in their library so I can check it out. I don't think that the name rings a bell, but maybe it's just because that's a that's a phrase from horse racing. But I don't think I have played that, so I'll have to check that out. Thank you for the recommendation. I do enjoy racing games, and I'm kind of a re remiss to have not played uh, Heat yet because I've heard great things about the new game Heat. Um, but I'm hoping to play that at Geekway. Geekway to the West. I keep saying Geekway. Geekway to the West is a convention in St. Louis that happens every year in like late May, early April. I always attend it just to go and play a bunch of games with random people who attend and hopefully not some not so random people, some friendly faces that I've seen in past years. So if you are looking for some gaming to do in, in May of this year, come to Geekway, play a game with me. I'd love to do that. Nate, bring, come, come and uh, bring a win place or show to Geekway. We'll play it there. Josh says, are you into social deduction games? I might try to bring a new one called Savage from Grinley Games to Geekway. It plays with 10 people between 30 to 60 minutes to uh, total. I'm happy to try it. Sure. Yeah. Um, I think sometimes finding, I guess, up to 10 people. Finding bigger groups of people at Geekway can sometimes be a little bit more difficult. But, uh, but feel free to bring it. It probably doesn't take up much space, and we can certainly try it. Um, I'm, I'm up for trying it. I think my, my ceiling for um, social deduction games is I would say usually around 30 minutes. I don't know if I'd want to play a 60 minute social deduction game, but you know, we could we could find a way to, to make that happen in a, in a reasonable amount of time, I think. Justin said that Final Girl season two just arrived for him. Emily says she's super excited about the civilizations that allow you to take turns after the fifth income turn. Which one was your favorite? It's a good question, Emily. Um, which one is my favorite? Here, I'll, I'll, I have the I have the pack right here. Let's pull out and see which ones do that. So the genies, do the genies do that? Genies say at the at the start of your income turn five, gain two different circle benefits of your choice. It does it does it is does feel really nice to do something after um, income turn five. Illuminati kind of has a VP bonus. Merfolk have at the start of income turn five, gain a, gain a tapestry card and return all submerged tapestry cards, a mechanism for Merfolk specifically uh, to your hand. Yeah, Merfolk actually build up to a rather big turn 
at, at the end of income turn five. I think that's the one I'm thinking of. There was one that really built up to a huge turn five income. And I believe that was, that was the income. Oh no, it was the elder ones. I think that might be the elder ones. Yeah. Elder ones say after income turn five, here, I'll show you what I'm looking at here. You may subs subsequently take advanced turns as usual, but not play trap or other response cards, nor take additional income turns during this period after your income five. And there's some other stuff that, that uh, some other rules there. I think that's the one that uh, that's really fun because it really builds up to doing a lot of stuff on income turn five, whereas usually it kind of peters out after that rather quickly based on how many resources you have available. What about you, Emily? Do you have a favorite one to play that has a, an after income turn five effect? Michael says, do you play any pickup and deliver games? We recently got a copy of Maglove Metro. I was curious about your opinion. I have played that. I have a video about it. It's been a while since I've played it. Um, I recall enjoying in Maglev Metro the sense of progression that comes from the workers that I think you, when you deliver them, you get to put them on your mat and that, that improves your mat from then on. Um, I really like progression in games and not all pickup and deliver games have progression, but those that do, I really appreciate that element about them. Um, that is one of the better, I think that that's one of the few, honestly, when I played Bag Love Metro, that was kind of a breath of fresh air because I think a number of the other pickup and deliver games I played up to that point did not have any progression to them. So I really enjoyed that aspect of it. I recently played Star Wars Outer Rim, which was kind of pitched to me, I think by Chad here, as a pickup and deliver game. It does have some elements like that where you're picking up a certain person from one place and delivering them to another place but that's just like kind of a small aspect of the game it's much more in my opinion a mission completion game where you're going to a certain place to do a thing there and so i would call that more of a mission completion game i think that's my preference where a game says you can do this thing or, or accomplish this goal but you have to go to a certain place to do it yato has that as well yato does that brilliantly that feels very thematic to me i really enjoy that aspect of uh having a kind of a job to do and having to do it at a specific place instead of abstractly wherever I want. So I really like games like that. Another game I played recently, this isn't a pickup and deliver game, but it's kind of been a Star Wars week for me. Um, I got Star Wars, the deck building game, and really raved about it the other day on my, my, my favorite mechanism video on Tuesday, yesterday. Uh, I really enjoyed this game. It has some really cool things happening in it. And, uh, I, I really liked the the element where the cards in the card row are kind of thematically they're they're living they're out in the world. It's not like Darth Vader is just like waiting to become Darth Vader when a player claims Darth Vader. Rather, Darth Vader is out there in the universe doing Darth Vader stuff, and the player, the Empire player, can kind of claim that card if they want. They can buy the Darth Vader card, or and this is the neat hook: the opposing player, the Rebel player, can take out Darth Vader before. I believe that it's sabotage. They can sabotage Darth Vader before the Imperial player can even claim Darth Vader if they want, if they can, if they can afford it. I really like that mechanism. Really, really like it. And they get a reward for it. They're not just removing it from the card row. They're getting a reward for for doing so. Uh, that felt really good, and it made me want, want to play again immediately. We only played once right now, but I'm eager to try the Rebels. I played as the Empire. I want to try the Rebels. But just having that idea where only some, some cards are available to you to buy. Uh, the, the Rebel player can't buy, can't acquire Darth Vader. Um, but the other player can still interact with that card before the Empire player has claimed him. Really cool. Really cool game. Steven says, are there plans for a new printing of the Tapestry Natural Rubber Playmat? There are, yeah. We're already working on it. And uh, it'll be a while because I think we just recently started the reprint. But it, it should be available, I think, in August or September. So it'll be a little bit of a wait, but we are making a new a reprint for it. Uh, Corey says he played No Thanks at his library's board game meetup over the weekend. That's a great game. Uh, I, I really love No, no Thanks. Uh, it only has a deck of cards and then some bid chips for each player. What's your favorite game that has a minimal amount of components? There are a lot of like small box travel friendly games that I that I really enjoy. Um, Actually, thinking of Star Wars, Star Realms is a game that Megan and I took when we traveled to New Zealand because it's such a small box. It doesn't take up a lot of space on the table. It's just cards. There's nothing else in the in the box other than cards and a, and a rule book that folds up nicely. So Star Realms comes to mind as one that 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 folds up well and doesn't that that has minimal components, in my opinion. Michael says that he's also enjoying the new season of Mandalorian. Emily says that she played the Illuminati last night and her husband felt like it was broken because she got a ton of resources or a boatload of victory points. Needless to say, he lost bad. 
Yeah, I think uh, whenever you lose tapestry, I think the instinct can be to say that the uh, opposing sieve is broken. But um, I think they're pretty balanced in this final final uh, final pack. We we really focused on balance in the in, in fantasies and futures. But I'm glad you won. I'm, uh, congratulations on the win, Emily. Uh, Trevor says to treat himself. He got a pecan pie for pie day yesterday, and he has plenty of leftovers for future treats. You know, I tried to make a pie yesterday, but the grocery store I go to didn't have any graham cracker pie crust, and uh, I thought about making my own, but wasn't in the mood to go all out in that way. So we just bought cupcakes instead for pie day. Pi Day is kind of extra special for St. Louis. Pi Day is uh, 314, March 14th, 3.14. But it's extra special for St. Louis because the area code in St. Louis is 314. Um, so a lot of businesses in St. Louis do something special for Pi Day. Although the cupcake place didn't do anything for Pi Day. Maybe they had a slow day due to it being Pi Day. Um... Miles says, what about a disc golf social deduction game? Miles, one of the guys that I played disc golf with, uh, shared a video the other day. Mark, uh, Miles, feel free to share, share it in the comments here, but uh, there's a, a group of disc golfers who tried to play a social deduction version of disc golf that involved, I believe, I didn't watch the video, but I believe it involves a trader in, uh, in a group of people playing disc golf, which is kind of clever. Also, it is disc golf season now. Disc golf season has officially started, at least the professional season has started. So, if you are looking to get into disc golf and you've tried out some of the Stillmeyer discs or are looking to throw them, I'd also recommend checking out the Jomez Pro YouTube channel. They're doing coverage for the tournaments, which generally happen every other weekend. There was one this past weekend. Their coverage is excellent. It's really, really good. And I think it's the type of coverage that if you are kind of intrigued by disc golf but don't know a lot about it, it's a great way to get into it. And they do, they covered the, uh, the men's and the women's disc golf pro tour. Um, that's Jomez, it's J-O-M-E-Z Pro. Awesome, awesome YouTube channel that, uh, that does really, really great coverage for disc golf. Whenever I watch a tournament, I get really, really excited to play. Um, so I'm excited to play this weekend. We generally play once per weekend. Played last weekend, had kind of a, a pretty intense round. People shooting scores all over the place. Um, we played at a place called Carrollton in St. Louis, which is a very long course. We were there for about three and a half hours. And... Uh, had fun, had fun. It was a little windier than I would like, but uh, with disc golf, you have to learn to cope with the wind. So that's part of the challenge. Chad says he just got his game back from being blind play tested. Overall, very positive, but I'm curious how much stock you put into a blind play tester that didn't read the entire rule book. Is it a deficiency of the rule book that, didn't, that it didn't hold their interest to read the entire thing, or is it a deficiency, deficiency of the play tester or both? I mean, a little bit of both. I, I would definitely put so a plate a blind someone signing up to be a lead blind playtester. It's their responsibility to learn the rules to the game, um, and so it's definitely partially on them. And it kind of indicates that maybe you shouldn't work with that lead playtester in the future. Um, but it's also an opportunity for you to figure out how to make the rulebook more engaging, maybe a little bit more readable, and maybe tighten it up a little bit if if uh, for some reason they aren't getting all the way through through it. But I would put. 75% of the impetus on them. I mean, a, a lead blind play tester has a tough job where they are reading a rule book that needs work, right? But that is part of their job as the lead blind play tester for a group to, to read that rule book and suffer through it and get through it and potentially ask you questions that they aren't, if they really are, are not finding something in the rule book. So I would put it mostly on that person. Um, but it is an opportunity, as always, with any feedback from blind playtesters or anything that you observe or anything anything that you get back from them, it's an opportunity to uh, improve. So, Chad, I appreciate you viewing it from both angles there. Uh, Brian says that he's confirming that the Tapestry Civilization complexity levels and tiers are not in the comprehensive rulebook. I don't think they were intended to be then, uh, but I do remember putting together the list. Like I said, it's been a long process of adjusting the civilizations. So, here, I'll look on our file management system to see if I have a note about it there. I know we put it together at some point. Let's see where, where I put that. I do, okay, here we go. <laughs> Under Tapestry Final Civ Adjustments, I have a complexity rating guide, guide for each sieve. Yeah, here we go. There we go, okay, yeah, we have it. Okay, yeah, we do have it. Didn't, didn't realize we had it, but we do. Um, yeah, I appreciate you mentioning that, so I would, I would remember that it exists. What else is going on? I'll, I'll pop over to some other questions in a second. Uh, 
working on a lot of game design. I have some, I'd, I've had some nice game design time over the last like four days. I had an incredibly uh, productive day yesterday with some game design. I won't say the game, but the game that I'm working on. And uh, also working through proofreading right now for a project that should enter print in about a month, I'm hoping. Um, so proofreading is going well for that. Also spent some time uh, with uh, Megan's sister-in-law this past weekend and, and uh, Megan's brother and Megan and Megan's mom because uh, her sister-in-law, please think happy thoughts for her because she tore her ACL recently or MCL. I always confuse the two. I'm pretty sure it's ACL. And so she went through the surgery last Thursday to, to uh, repair that. And so it's a very kind of painful week that follows that surgery because they've, they've taken another part of her body out and reattached it as her new ACL is my understanding. And she has to like keep it limber. She has to acclimate her new body to this, this body part that's in a different place than it normally belongs, or it just won't work. And so, um, She's working through that and we've kind of gone over a few times. Megan's been very helpful. Her mom's been very helpful to go over there and uh, keep her entertained and distracted and, uh, and just give her company in, in a tough time. So please keep her in your thoughts if you can. Um, and, oh, yeah, okay, I already mentioned. Oh, no, I haven't. I, I think I did mention it earlier, but in case you're joining now, the Tapestry Fantasies and Futures shipping is uh, pretty much everything has shipped out from fulfillment centers. I think the U.S. Fulfillment Center said they will be done by the end of today. So you should have a shipment notification today, maybe tomorrow, if you have it from the U.S. Um, and as I said before, too, if you missed this, it is possible that your order has shipped and you haven't gotten a shipping notification. If maybe the fulfillment center messed up and didn't, if they shipped to the right place but didn't send the notification. Maybe it, there's a, something that didn't sync with Shopify to send you that notification. Or, um, or your email address wasn't entered incorrectly. So that can be it, too. Also, just to let you know, if you order from the U.S. store, mostly if you're in the U.S., you would order from the U.S. store, we are warehousing and fulfilling through Miniature Market now. Uh, it's not their retail side. It's just their, their warehouse, their fulfillment center. And so your email notification will say Miniature Market, which is not ideal. We are working on changing that, but it has to do with how they are linked to UPS. But if you get an email notification from Miniature Market and you're like, oh, I didn't buy anything from Miniature Market, it's because it's your recent order from us being fulfilled through Miniature Market. So we're working on that. Sorry for the confusion there. Had a nice brunch with some friends this weekend where I uh, taught and played uh, Etiwa. It's A-T-I-W-A, the new bat-themed game from Uza Rose Rosenberg. I talked about it on Instagram actually today. Um, had a good time doing that. And I also had a nice lunch, a nice somewhat unexpected lunch with my old friend Richard Bliss of the Funding the Dream podcast, which is still available. Richard hasn't recorded anything new for years, but if you are looking to get into Kickstarter and crowdfunding, it's a really inspirational podcast. He's a great interviewer, and I had many chats with him back in the day when he was running the podcast, and there are many, many other chats with other creators on there. Um, but Richard w was in town for some consulting, an, cult, uh, an appearance he was doing here in St. Louis, and it was great just to sit down and chat with him. I haven't seen him in years or really talked to him in detail in years. And that was a, just a really special conversation for me to be able to hang out with Richard for a little bit. I wrote about that on Instagram too, about people that have inspired me or inspired you, if you have anyone that comes to mind, even if it's someone that you haven't met. Like it doesn't have to be, it can be anyone, you know, there are lots of people that, that inspire me. Um, and Richard definitely comes to mind. David says, what's the hardest part about making a rule book? Um, I mean, I would say the biggest challenge, David, is uh, putting yourself in the shoes of someone who doesn't know the game at all, even though that you are someone who knows the game really well. That's a huge challenge. It's difficult to do. It takes a lot of empathy uh, and learned empathy, I think, to do that, to, to step outside of yourself and step outside of what is intuitive to you as someone who knows the game versus someone who doesn't know it. It's why we have a big oversight team, people who don't know the game at all, who have no connection to it and see it for the first time and are trying to learn it through the rule book. And it's also a pretty special skill for that oversight team to, to have and to hone, to be able to say, what am I not understanding here? What am I trying too hard to understand? What isn't intuitive so that I can make this better for those who are, uh, who are learning for the first time from the rule book? Yeah, I would say that's the biggest challenge. Uh, Chris says, Chris is working on a game and he has been devouring my game, my game videos lately. So thank you, Chris, for going through those game videos. Hopefully they've been helpful for you. My video this past weekend was about my favorite games of all time. Actually, I do this video uh, twice a year, every six months. And I look at all the games that I've ranked in any video, any theme, any mechanism, anything that any game that's appeared in, as in the number one or number two slot 
I think at least twice is my requirement, maybe even just once, um, is eligible for my current top number, the top 10 favorite list. And so I, I filmed that video uh, a little while ago and posted it this past weekend. And uh, some, some games have really shifted around on that list quite a bit. So feel free to check out that list on my YouTube channel if you're curious about what my favorite games are right now. Nate says, will there be a PDF posted on the Stone Mario Games site of the corrected Tapestry Civ Adjustments page from the complete rulebook? Um, I'd like to put print that out in my rulebook. Nate, we will update the file for the uh, comprehensive rulebook on our website. Um, there's a little mistake on the back page where it says historians, even though it means heralds. It's very clear in the description that it's referring to the heralds. But you, uh, that, that rulebook, that PDF will be available on our website. Um, my graphic designer is very busy with some other stuff right now, but uh, that will eventually go up there. Uh, let's see. Tim says, are you excited about the new Lord of the Rings magic set? The, what is it, Tales from Middle-Earth? Oh, Tim, I'm so excited. There was a big reveal yesterday on the Wizards of the Coast, like Magic the Gathering page, if you want to check it out. A big article where they show the One Ring, they show Frodo, they show Gandalf the Grey, um... I think they show some some really cool land. They show Mordor. Um, yeah, I, I, they've done a really good job of that, as far as I can I can tell from first glance. I'm very excited to play it, Tim. I, I'm itching to pre-order it whenever I can from from my local game store. Um, yeah, I'm really really excited. Is anyone else excited about that? Have you checked out checked out the new uh, what they've teased so far? They haven't teased much, but the new Lord of the Rings Magic the Gathering set. Um, Oh, Josh says he saw Bullet Heart played, and it looks really good at, at Dice Tower West. I think Josh is referring to. Yeah, this is a game that I've really enjoyed. It's a, it's a hard game to pitch. Bullet, it's it's a very abstract game, and yet it it it's like a pattern matching game that just feels really good to play to complete these patterns. Um, yeah, yeah, it's a game that I've I've talked about a few times on my on my YouTube channel recently. But Josh, yeah, I hope you get the chance to play it. I have a copy that I'm really enjoying. Tony says, is uh, the video a little lower quality today? It, it could be Tony. Um, it could be your connection. It's probably, it's probably not your connection, though. It's probably Facebook or my connection here. Sorry about that. Josh says that he enjoyed seeing Let's Go to Japan by AEG, that he enjoyed seeing that at Dice Tower West. I'm curious to see what they do with that. I have a very strong connection with Japan. I studied Japanese for years and studied abroad in Hiroshima and Kyoto. So I'm curious to see what they what they do with that. Um, Arama says, hello from San Francisco. We played Tap Street with Fantasy of Futures for the first time last night. Awesome, thanks for getting to the table so quickly. I, I love it to hear when people get one of these expansions and just shuffle it up and go. It doesn't, really for an expansion like this, you do not have to learn very much at all. Just learn how the charms work and how is that it? Oh, and some of the, the, the tech uh, cards have something that, that happens after the fifth income turn that you have to pay attention to. Um, he says, our favorite new addition is the new charms and income turn five mechanism on tapestry cards. Also, I love how the small how the rulebook has a smaller footprint than the previous one, easy to leave on the table, similar to Libertalia, which, uh, Winds of Gilcrest. Uh, yeah, this is something that we've been doing from our, um, for our rulebooks ever since Liber uh, Libertalia. I'm trying to get the rulebooks down to a smaller size so that you can more easily leave it on the table as a reference while you're playing and also more easily open it with two hands. This is something that I learned from the Cardboard Herald, a YouTube channel. Jack talked about it there in reference to a game from Plaid Hat Games. And I was like, I'd never thought about that before. I've, I've been trying to cram everything into like the, the biggest rulebook possible on the fewest pages, but I think it's much handier just to be able to actually reference the rulebook and keep it on the table for that reason. So, um, yeah, it's definitely something we'll be we'll be doing in the future. We'll probably continue to experiment with the size a little bit to find the right size. But uh, yeah, it's definitely something we're doing in the future. I think maybe maybe wingspan. No, wingspan Asia is a little bit bigger. Yeah, there's a there's a size that's a little bit bigger than the one in Fantasies of the Futures that I'm that I'm playing around with. Josh says, "What are your most recent favorite small box games?" I've been loving Skull King. Uh, Star Wars, I don't know if this is quite small box, but uh, I really enjoy the Star Wars, the deck building game. That's a smaller box. And a friend brought a game called 535 to game night the other night, and I really enjoyed that. So those are a few that come to mind. Chris says, he's a software developer. I have a plan to create the game digitally, and then if it grows, then publish it as a board game. It's easier to make changes to a digital game than a published game. I definitely agree with that, absolutely. What do you think about that plan? 
Chris, it's hard for me to speak to that plan from a marketing um, sales perspective, but I think it has potential. Uh, it's worth an experiment for sure. And I totally agree with how easy it is to iterate a digital game versus a tabletop game. Uh, once I once I print a rule book and send it out to 5,000 people, I can't change that rule book. I, I can change the PDF on our website, but I can't change the rule book itself. Whereas you can definitely do that on a digital game. Um, I think a challenge there though is with a digital game, people generally don't want to read a rule book for a digital game. Um, but you will need a rule book for the tabletop game. So you can learn a lot from the user experience of the digital version, I think, but you will still have to find a way to convert that into a written rule book for the final version or the printed version. Yeah. Mark says that he also enjoys the Funding the Dream podcast. And he says uh, Richard's podcast motivated him to try and design games thanks to that podcast. Chad says, have you been inspired to play Star Wars Rebellion again? I haven't. You know, I used to have a copy. I gave it away. Um, I, I really appreciated the two or three times that I played the game, but um, it's just a really long game. And I, I, I generally don't play games that play over three hours. But I, I loved my experiences with Star Wars Rebellion. But for a Star Wars game right now, if I'm going to play a Star Wars game, it's definitely going to be the deck building game here. Um, doesn't play with a lot of players, but uh, it only plays two players. But... That's fine. A lot of the games that I play are just with Megan anyway. Carol says, your top 10 seem to be on the lighter weight overall this time, except for Arc Nova. Arc Nova was on there as a, as a heavier game. Um, yeah, I think there were like five medium weight games and then some, a few lighter games. Do you think you are trending that way currently? It comes and goes. In fact, Carol, I don't, I don't know if I'd entirely agree because Dune Imperium's on there. Clank is on there. Those are very solidly like middleweight two hour games. Role player is a 90 minute game. I think that is still the sweet spot for me, the, the 90 minute middleweight Euro game. There are some lighter games on there, um, but I think, I, I don't know if I'm trending entirely towards lighter. Maybe, Carol, part of it is that I, the game night that I host, it's a two hour game night. And generally that means that we end up playing a lot of shorter games instead of a single longer game. And there's another game night that I attend maybe twice a month where they focus on playing a really longer game. But because the one I host, the one that I actually host, uh, focuses on shorter games, maybe I am uh, focusing a little bit on shorter and lighter games or gravitating towards them a little bit. Yeah. Skyler says the sequel to the video game Zelda The Breath of the Wild will release in May. Uh, it might even be sooner than that. It might be April, Skyler. It's coming out soon, whatever it is, the sequel to The Breath of the Wild. That has been a, the original Breath of the Wild has been a huge inspiration for me in terms of an open world game that I'm designing. And uh, However, I should say, I am not a video gamer. I, I have only played 20, 30 minutes of Breath of the Wild. It's really my... Knowledge of it has come from watching Let's Play videos and reviews and deep dive design discussions about the game. I've I've probably watched hundreds of hours of videos about the game at this point. I know it's different to experience the game, but um, I don't know. I'm just not that much of a video player. So I probably won't play the, the new version. Um, I might try to get Megan to play it if Megan would be interested in playing it and I could, I could hang out with her while she plays it. But just that style of video game uh, where it's real time and uses... A, I don't know. It's um, I, I've never really been a, a, a video gamer uh, all that much, especially if there's uh, multiple controls to handle. Um, if I can just use, use my mouse, I can I can I can do that. But yeah, I just uh, haven't really gotten into video games for the for, for the control reason. I think for the most part, and also because I don't want to get sucked into a video game and have it take me away from all the other responsibilities that I have or all the creative things that I want to do with game design. So I'm very excited about it, but I probably won't be actually playing it. I'll just be learning about it. Trishul says the Lord of the Rings cards artwork looks very cinematic and specular. Specular, spectacular. Where does your taste stand along the ultra realistic to ultra stylistic spectrum? Spectrum. I like. That's a good question. So I, so I really like the art. So if we're talking about intellectual properties, I really like the art in the Star Wars deck building game. I know I've been talking about this a lot, but let me give an example here. So, like, this style of art is to me close to being realistic, but it has a stylized element to it that lets me separate it from reality a little bit. I also really like what a welcome, a Awakened Realms does with their style, where they essentially are using concept art as their primary art in their games. And I really like the look of concept art. There's something about how my brain can fill in the gaps in between the concept and reality in a way that is that 
feels nice, feels good, I guess. Um, so I like that concept art look to, to games. Um, I also like in Magic the Gathering in particular, though, when they do something super stylistic just for fun. Not on every card, but on certain cards, they have special cards that have alternate artwork that's super stylized. I like that. I don't think I'd like it across an entire set, but I like it on some cards. Yeah. Kevin's joining us from Australia, very, very late or early in Australia. He says he's up for because of his six-month-old twin boys. He received uh, the Tapestry Fantasies and Futures expansion, the insert, plans and ploys, smitten, rolling rooms, pro rolling rooms promos, a lot of stuff. Thank you, Kevin, for getting all that stuff. He says he'll have to wait in his birthday and to, for his birthday in April um, because it will be a birthday present from his kids. Oh, you are a patient man, Kevin. Um, but uh, but that's really cool. That's really cool that you are uh, you're, you're waiting to give for your kids to give that gift to you. Yeah, I hope your twin boys are doing well. Zach says, are there any new games you've tried recently on Board Game Arena and Light? I recently tried Sea Salt and Paper, which isn't brand new on Board Game Arena, but it's new to me and it's fairly, fairly new to the platform. And I did really enjoy my first play of that. I need to play that again. Um, it has an end of round mechanism that I had to wrap my mind around a little bit, but the core aspect of what I'm doing on my turn in that game, I, I really do enjoy. Tony says his group played Wheels versus Doors last week, which is an interesting, is this more than that game with a cool wagering component? That's neat. Have you played or heard of it? I have not. I have not heard of that. And what is your favorite wagering non-poker game? My favorite wagering non-poker game. It's been a while since I played Wits and Wagers, but I did enjoy that. As someone who's not good at trivia, but likes guessing at things, I enjoyed Wits and Wagers a lot. That's probably the one that comes to mind in terms of wagering. There's like bidding games and auctioning games, but I put wagering in a slightly different category. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I'll say what's in wagers, the game with wagering in the name itself. Um, my blog post recently were about uh, a sale that we did for champions, although it's a sale that anyone can find, but only champions actually get to vote on and know about. It was a kind of a this or that sale. Oh, I know who's calling me right now, but uh, it's a... Uh, wire transfer thing um but uh but yeah this was, so it's a sale where champions each month month get to choose between two products and one of those products will go on sale the following month with whichever one gets more votes goes on sale the following month champions also get to nominate a product to be eligible for the 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 head-to-head -head matchup for the following month and i pick from from some of the games that they or games or products that they nominated and then that game will just be on product or that product will be on on sale, be, on, be discounted on our web store for the next month. That's been really fun to do. Also talked about something I don't like on the opposite end of the spectrum, chargebacks. When a customer, and I, I'm sure most of you are great at this, if you have a problem with an order, contact, please contact us. I won't speak for other companies. Contact us directly and say, here's my order number. I'm worried about it. It didn't happen as, a, as I wanted. I, uh, I, I'd like to cancel it. Whatever it may be, if you have an issue with an order, come directly to us. Email, there's more emails on our website, contact forms on our website. Um, don't though, don't go to your credit card company or your bank or to, or to PayPal and issue a chargeback. That creates huge complications whenever that happens. That, take a lot longer to process uh, than you just coming directly to us and having us figure it out. Um, so I wrote a big article to let you know about how, how complex that can be, how complicated and arduous really it can be if you use the chargeback system instead of just going directly to us as the publisher to solve the problem. So that was my article last, last Thursday. Um, oh, I did have a question. Of the, actually, I did two more things, and then I'll focus on, on your questions. What is your favorite game that you think has the right amount of replayability? So what is a game that you, and I, I use that term the right amount because there are some games that I think try too hard to have replayability to the point that it makes setup really a, a, a beast to, to get the game to the table in the first place. Where you're putting like, you know, three dozen little tiles and tokens all over the board every game. Um, so what is the game that really hits the sweet spot for how it approaches replayability and how much replayability you feel like you get out of the game? That's my question for you today. I'll come back to my last topic later. I'll throw that out there for now. Trishul actually has a, has a somewhat related question about asymmetry. Asymmetry is a way that you can offer replayability in games. He says, what are your thoughts on heavily asymmetric games such as Merchant's Cove and Root? Is something like that mostly out of similar game scope based on your focus on quick starts and easy player onboarding? I'd actually say Root, uh, 
has pretty decent onboarding for players. Um, it has a little quick start guide for each player. Uh, their, their player mats walk players through their turn really well. Um, and the, the core rules of the game are very simple. I think it works then. If the core rules and the objective of the game are very, very simple, then it lets players focus on the asymmetric element of, of what they're doing. I've not played Merchant's Cove. I want to. I have a friend who owns it. But I have played Root a couple times. Um, it's a game that doesn't hit the table very often because of the downtime between turns, because of all those steps that you're doing on your turn. But because of those steps, it is, I think, pretty easy just to jump in and say, okay, on turn one, I'll, I'll just walk through these steps until I understand this this faction, and then I understand them for the rest of the game. Um, as, as for Stillmeyer games, I don't, I'm not entirely against it, but uh, it isn't something that we have in the works right now. Like, I, I obviously, I like asymmetry in games. I like asymmetric pairing, pairings in particular, and Scythe and Expeditions, even in uh, Viticulture, the Mabas, or the red and blue cards, they, uh, they, they match up to create an asymmetric pairing uh, for starting resources at least. So I love asymmetric pairings, but I think I'm more more into m more mild asymmetry than having each player do a completely different thing or play a completely different game, essentially. I'm also excited about the game Mythwind. Mythwind has heavy asymmetry as well. George says, would it be possible in the future to send some Green Gully discs to the Europe UK store? I'm missing this one, and the store has never had it in stock. Sure, George. Yeah, I think, I think Joe is listening now, so maybe Joe can make a note that there is a... Uh, a desire for the Green Gully disc in Europe. That is still my go-to putter. Uh, I love the Green Gully disc, although I did miss two really dumb putts the other day when I was playing. Um, but uh, that, that's what disc golf, that's what happens when you when you miss those 10-foot putts. Carol says she was thinking about Dune, Arc Nova, and Clank seemed medium to heavy and the rest seemed lighter. Yeah, um, as compared to other lists that have included Sulkin, Uwe Rosenberg games, Terra Mystica, uh, she says, I feel like our, I feel our medium to light games hit the table more as well right now. Yeah, I don't, I, maybe it's, I don't entirely know what it is. I, I, I think part of it is my gaming group. Um, maybe part of it is my gaming preferences. But uh, but yeah, medium to light might be where I'm leaning a little bit or maybe just solidly in that medium category. But there are a lot, a lot of lighter games that I really enjoy quite a bit. Melissa says that her husband can relate to my... Uh, Foibles with game controllers. Uh, uh, she says her husband can't use her video game controllers either. I've tried a few times to help him, but he just gets frustrated. And that was what happened when I tried to play Breath of the Wild. As cool as the game was, controlling like the camera with one joystick and uh, the and the, and the character Link with another joystick, and then having to sometimes use another control to like pick up things, like levitate things, it was just a lot. I, I had more fun watching videos of people playing. Uh, Breath of the Wild than I, than I had playing it myself because of that. Which is probably a good reminder for me as a game designer too that sometimes the mechanisms can get in the way of the flow of the game. I have to remember that for, for tabletop games as well. David says, do you think the board game market is starting to get saturated with existing IP games? The amount of TV shows and video games getting board game adaptations have been growing quite quite quickly. Um... I think, I think there's probably saturation in the board game market in general. Um, I'm hoping for, for publishers to publish fewer games rather than more games. Uh, and I think a lot of publishers are already, already doing that. They're focusing on maybe one or two, maybe three games a year at most. Um, but as for IP games in particular, I don't necessarily think so. I think, I think we're kind of in a, in a golden age of IP games where I, uh, intellectual properties aren't just being slapped on an existing game. Rather, they are being... Uh, incorporated that the themes of those games are being incorporated really really well and even games being designed from the ground up um incorporated around a, th a certain theme i think is uh, is really neat to see and I, I like both i mean i like so star wars the deck building game it's pretty similar to star realms definitely had to be inspired by star realms and maybe ascension a little bit but it's very much its own thing i'm happy to have it in the collection along with shards of infinity along with star realms i played marvel remix the other day which is uh, like Fantasy Realms, but with Marvel. And it very much also does its own thing. So I don't mind IP games doing that. I don't feel like they're just slapping a theme on it. I think they really did make an, uh, a concerted effort to incorporate those themes into these games that I mentioned. But I also appreciate games like... Um, what's uh, what's one, uh, some of these video games, these big video games that have come out. I don't know if I backed a bunch of them, but I, I appreciate them taking this video game world, this, this video game theme, and building a game... A tabletop game around that theme from the ground up. I think that's pretty cool too. Stardew Valley, there was one that that uh, that I have played. 
Zach says, if a second new game were to be released by Snowmare Games this year, would that game have to be in a similar part of the process as Expeditions or a few months behind that? Um, so for a game to be released later in 2023, we would have to get it to the printer in about a, about a month, maybe a month or two at most. Probably, about, probably in, in the next month. Yeah. Expeditions is well beyond that. Expeditions is... Uh, Expeditions really went to the printer back in December, and then there was the Chinese New Year in February, and so uh, that's why when I announced it, it was still only in early production, and we were able to uh, still change some of those files and impact the size of the print run. Josh asked how Walter and Biddy are doing. I don't know if you just saw Walter in the background there. He's Walter's doing well, fluffy as always, very floofy. Biddy is uh, Biddy's my boy. He's he's doing well too. Yeah, thanks for asking about them. Uh, Carol says, how are your April Fool's plans going this year? Going well. I, I mentioned earlier, I'm, I filmed a video about uh, pets strategizing over games. There's Walter again. Um, I filmed that video yesterday for April 1st, and we have some surprises for March 29th. March 29th is is going to be our April Fool's Day because it's it's a Wednesday. It's when we do our when, we, when we're scheduled to send our e-newsletter and when I'm scheduled to go live here, opposed to a Saturday for April Fool's, uh, April 1st. So, yeah. Stay tuned in two weeks for our April Fool's surprises. Zach mentions player, a planet unknown as a game with a lot of replayability. Um, Miles mentions uh, Quacks of Quinlanburg as a game with lots of replayability. Yeah, those are good. I should write these down because I'm going to do a list about this. I, I asked this question to ambassadors recently, so you guys may have mentioned it there too. But uh, Quacks, Planet Unknown. In fact, Planet Unknown does it so well that I, have, I still have yet to play any asymmetric planet on Planet Unknown, and yet every time I play it feels like a fresh new game. That's, that's impressive when they do that. Um, Tony looked at the number of games that he's played a number of times. That's a good metric to do it. Look at, look at games that you've played many, many times. Uh, Wingspan, yeah, Wingspan does have great replayability, absolutely. Um, Shards of Infinity does, Gizmos, Role Player, Star Wars Outer Rim. I can see Outer Rim having a lot of replayability, a lot of different paths to victory in Outer Rim. Role player, yeah, role player has a ton of replayability, and uh, it, a lot of it coming from the setup of your different your backstory, the different things, that you, the different goals that you have on your mat. Um, gizmos and shards of infinity, yeah, some great, great answers here so far. David says he prefers games like Azul, Cascadia, Hanami Koji, or even a Dog Lover when it comes to replayability. While modular games can add a lot for replayability, they also usually imply having to learn more rules or setup. Definitely agree with that, which is an idea for me for a game that is comfor comfortably replayable. Yeah, I, I do like when games like, don't require any special setup. Uh, Cascadia, I think, does actually have a little bit of variable setup that requires you to shuffle a bunch of different... Uh, is it decks of cards, I think? Um, so it adds a little bit of time to play up, but to set up, but not, not all that much time. But yeah, I can definitely see the, the replayability from Cascadia kind of in the same category as... Um, as role player in terms of the different goals. Although in that case, it's the goals that all players are going after. Hanami Koji. Hanami Koji is oddly replayable, even though there's nothing variable about it at all. It's just the, the different variability in the, the hands of cards that you get. Um, oh, and just to clarify, for this replayability question, I'm not referring to campaign, legacy, or escape room style games. I'm, I'm glad Tabletop Games blog mentioned this. I'm looking for games that are designed to be played over and over again, re repeated, um, and also they feature great replayability. They give you a reason to want to get back, want it to get back to the table. But as I say that, Clank comes to mind because I love with Clank choosing a different path down into the dungeon than the previous time I, that I played, even with the exact same map. And also the card, the card row, I think, is uh, does that well. Uh, Tap Street was mentioned here for for replayability. I agree with that. I mean, I I design all of our games to be replayable. Uh, often through different types of variability. Skylar says, I noticed a decent amount of trick-taking games in the last year among your favorite mechanism videos. Has that become a favorite mechanism, mechanism of yours or just a coincidence? It's actually because there are several guys in my game group, people in my game group um, in particular, who love trick-taking and shedding style games. And so they brought a lot of those games to game night. And it's definitely opened me to to enjoying them a lot more than I than I once did. Like Skull King is now one of my favorite games. Really, really enjoy that game. Um, I mentioned five three five also earlier in the video. So yeah, I, I think having them bring those games to game night 
has opened me to to what I like about them and sometimes what I don't like about them. It's a little bit of both, but uh, but I've been, I've been exposed to a lot more things to them, for sure. Henry too. Henry loves uh, trick taking and shutting games. Chad likes the replayability of Scythe. Scythe is another one that uses different uh, variable elements and uh, different uh, uh, asymmetric pairings at the beginning of the game. Mark is going to try out the modular board for Scythe. That can add even more replayability. Yeah. Joe says that he is going to send some Green Gully discs. Uh, Joe's acting fast here to the European Fulfillment Center. It'll take a few weeks for them to get there. And, um, and he's added it... Okay, and he's added that as a product listing. First, we might have all the, maybe, Joe can correct me, but we might have all of the discs listed on each of the web stores, even though some of them have never actually been carried there. That's so you can sign up for a back-in-stock notification, and that signals to us that you want us to send that product to your fulfillment center. So please, for us or for any other company that offers back-in-stock notifications, I know you don't want to sign up for yet another e-newsletter. This is not that. This is a one-time notification. Uh, to, for us to let you know when it is back in stock. And most importantly, it lets us know that we should restock it or we should make more of a certain product. This is often how we gauge interest in reprinting or restocking products. It's based on what you tell us. Otherwise, we don't know. We don't want to send 100 discs to, to the UK uh, if no one's there to actually buy them. Yeah. Simon says, a viticulture question. Can I use the base game Summer Visitors deck and the Rhine Winter Visitors deck? Oh, interesting question. Um, because you can't shuffle the Rhine deck in with uh, non-Rhine cards, but Simon, I think you could do that. As long as you make it clear to all players what you're doing there, um, I think you could actually do that. Yeah, that's a clever clever little variant there. Let me know how it goes if you try that. Kenny says he feels like Root with the expansions and hirelings has some good replay replayability. I definitely agree with that. I think Root you, leans into the asymmetric asymmetric side of replayability. David says pretty much any roll or flip and write I consider to be very comfortably replayable because you have that variability of the dice, that 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 element that you can't control that changes every time you play, uh, for sure. Uh, Rolling Realms is built around, in fact, I would say a lot of our games, I really do design a lot of our games around the idea of being very, very replayable. It's why I, I still continue to enjoy playing Rolling Realms to this day. I'm going to end up mentioning a lot of our own games on this list, I think. Carol says, Arc Nova and Dune Imperium for replayability. Um, deck builders in general th offers a lot. Yeah. In fact, I'm going to do another list soon, revisiting my favorite deck builders, because I think that list has grown over time. Um, so yeah, Arc Nova. Arc Nova is one that I just enjoy getting to the table every time. Uh, very intrinsically motivated to do different things in Arc Nova. Dune Imperium as well. Tons of replayability. Um, I was curious with Dune Imperium. So Dune Imperium to me feels like a game with lots of replayability. And so I was curious, how many cards are in that deck of cards? Guess right now, how many cards in Dune Imperium, in the core game, how many cards do you think are in the core deck of cards? The one that where you reveal five cards, five cards come out of that deck or are face up at all times. How many cards do you think are in that deck for a game that feels like it has a lot of replayability? Guess I'll come back to that in a second because I'm gonna, I'll compare it to Expeditions in a second, because I think I, I heard some comments from people wondering how much replayability is in, in Expeditions, and Expeditions has a certain number of unique cards that I'll mention in a second. Um, yeah, well, hang on to that thought. Guess in the comments how many, not unique cards, but how many cards are in the deck of Dune Imperium. Uh, Trishul says, after Tapestry Fantasies and Futures, will there be some, will there still be some small packs and promo items released for the game? Uh, I don't think so. I, when, whenever we release a comprehensive rulebook for a game, that is kind of the signal that we're done adding more stuff. It isn't a hard stop. It is possible, but it's very unlikely at that point. So the other thing that we have planned are the, the, the uh, adjusted Civ pack. Um, but beyond that, I think that'll, that'll probably be the, the last thing for Tapestry that we make. But we'll see. I, I don't necessarily want to say never for that. Tapestry doesn't have the same like story arc that Scythe did That when I said there's, this is the end of Scythe. Brandon also mentioned Dune Imperium. Uh, Nathan said that he also enjoys Skull King. Oh, the other thing that I wanted to mention before I forget, um, Panda, the manufacturing company that we work with, that we love, they're based in Canada. They have their main factory in China. Uh, they released, and they've been doing a lot of work, uh, they released a guide called the Green Games Guide. 
I believe it's called, it's GGG, Green Games Guide. They released that today, uh, something they've been working on for a long time to improve the sustainability and eco-friendliness of the products they make. It's something that we've worked with them a lot. You've seen these things happen in Wingspan and other products where we've been using materials other than plastic usually, but it's more than that. It's also about using sustainably forested wood for cardboard and wooden bits, those sorts of things. Panda has a whole guide that they released that you can check out today. It's on their website. It's the Green Games Guide from Panda. So if you are a, a publisher or a game designer who's interested in learning more about sustainable components and how you can make more sustainable products, you can either work with Panda, they'll help you make it easy, or you can look at the guide and learn from the guide as well. Chad says he enjoys the replayability of brass. Yeah, I can definitely see that. Having the, a player-controlled market almost in brass a little bit. Uh, Corey says, Disney Sorcerer's Arena Epic Alliances has a ton of replay replayability since they keep releasing new characters. Um, that reminds me a little bit as well of a um, Villainous, which has so many different variable characters with, with high amounts of um, asymmetry between them. I haven't played Sorcerer's Arena yet. So Chad is going to guess 70 cards in Dune Imperium. Carol's guessing 100. Let's see if there's any other guesses. I don't see any other guesses. So there are 67. 67 cards in Dune Imperium's variable deck. And some of them are not unique. I would say there's probably around 55, 50 to 55 unique cards in there. Some are repeated. That really surprised me because Dune Imperium feels like it has a ton of replayability. And yet it has a relatively slim deck of cards. Expeditions has 90 unique cards. 90 unique cards. So it's... Uh, pretty much double the number of unique cards in that deck of Dune Imperium, 50% uh, more uh, total cards. Uh, but yeah, I think that, that's a testament to how the card design itself and controlling how many cards players really get a, during a game. If you're getting 30 cards over a course of a game, you need a pretty big deck there. But in Dune Imperium, maybe you're getting 8 to 12 cards at most over the course of the game. And so every card has a pretty big impact. And the design of those cards is a big impact on how you use, how you run your deck, how you, how you play. And I think the same goes for Expeditions as well. Uh, Tabletop Games blog mentioned Scout as a very replayable game. I can definitely see that. David says, what kind of games would you consider not great for replayability? Uh, I don't know if I want, to, I want to pick on a certain game here in particular. But that's true. I probably do need to examine the, convert, the converse of it. Like what games... So, well, I'm going to do a video about games that I'm happy that I played once, but it's not necessarily about the, those, the, the replayability of those games. Um, that's a good question, David. I guess the idea for re replayability is that even if you wanted to do the exact same thing uh, in game two as you did in game one, the game doesn't really let you do that. That there are variable elements or elements of, of setup that change whenever you play. It makes me think of uh, Terra Mystica, actually. Um, that... I kind of force you down a different strategic path or, or encourage you to consider a new strategic path than the previous time you played. So there are certain games that I think just do that better than other. I'm looking at my shelf over here. Let's see if there's a game that doesn't do that well that I still enjoy. Maybe I can mention one that, that doesn't have great replayability. Oh, our, our, uh, Castles, I think, does has great replayability. You know, a lot of games on my shelf have really, really good replayability. So I don't know... I don't know if one is jumping out right off the bat as a game that doesn't have good replayability. Maybe just because it isn't going to end up sitting on my shelf if it uh, if it does. Yeah, I don't know if I I don't necessarily see one over there right now. Trishul says that Hanabi is one of his most replayed games, more due to the strategies the players want to try rather than what the game offers. And I can feel the same way about the mind. Like the mind to me is very replayable. Replayable. It's one of those, let's play one more time games or one more round. And yet it's so streamlined and so simple. And they're really, the variability is the numbers, but that isn't that, isn't that different at all. It's not like, not like setup is any different in the mind. You're just shuffling the cards. And yet it feels very replayable. replayable. Mark says, games I enjoy with the perfect amount of replayability and variability would be the Guild of Merchant Explorers. Oh, that's a great game. I, I need to get that back to the table. I'll make a note about that one. Um... Rolling Realms, thank you, Mark. Uh, Parks, the, ca the Castles of Burgundy, and Reviving Kathmandu. I need to, I've backed Reviving Kathmandu, but I haven't played it yet. Kenny says, have I played Zaya? Uh, his, his roommate got it years ago. We, we've never brought it to the table. I played it once. That was a, that was a play it once game for me. Um, I'm glad I played it once. Uh, I, played, I played Star Wars Outer Rim recently and really enjoyed that. And that kind of scratched the same itch as, as Zaya uh, for me, but in a, 
in a way that I think is maybe a little bit more accessible. There's a Zaya's a big big idea game. It was it was uh, uh, Cody's first game. A lot of stuff going on, um, but uh, but it's, a, it's still an impressive impressive game. Tony says, did you see that board cubator Project L has recovered from their failed Kickstarter and is not only re-releasing all previously published Project L games components, but is giving away new puzzles for previous ambassadors backers. You know, I didn't hear that they had turned that around. Um, ironically, I was just looking at the game Project L on my on my uh, shelf, wondering if I would consider that a replayable game. I think so, probably, based on the, the different tiles that come up. But it's still, that's a game that feels pretty similar every time you play. So I will, uh, thank you for that link, Tony. I'll check that out after the live cast. Uh, Miles says, Concordia has some nice replayability with where the resources end up and how new cards come out. That, definitely, Miles. Definitely agree with Concordia. And Shobu is a game that doesn't have variable elements but feels very different every time, every time we play. I know Megan really enjoyed our first play of Shobu at Geekway. We need to play that again. Um, all right. Oh, Chad says, what's for lunch? What, when should we arrive? <laughs> In fact, I do need to go break for lunch right now. I think I'm doing a hand pie for lunch today. And Megan is doing, I think we're actually both doing hand pies for lunch today. So we'll enjoy that, that, uh, that little treat in a few minutes over either Ted Lasso or Mandalorian. I'll let Megan decide in a few seconds. But thank you for joining me today. Good to see all of you. And I will be back as usual next Wednesday for another chat. I'll see you then. Bye.